Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Chimchak. Today, we've got Ken Rose on uh, from the band Hero Jr. Ken is a good buddy of Mike's, and um, we thought this was really interesting. You know, I've got to watch some of Ken's videos, and he's essentially flipped the bird to the traditional way of working all day at a gas station or at a big box store and then going and spending your hard-earned cash at a recording studio. He took the the plunge and just decided he's going to be a one-stop shop and take his creative sort of control of his life and just put it all in this house. And in this this house is in Nashville. Where are you at? No, I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana. Oh, right now. awesome. Because it looks yep. like it could be a little East Nashville crib over there. That's kind of all those old uh, craftsman house architecture. Yep. Uh, but this house is essentially a recording studio, right? Yep. The in- the whole we turned the the whole bottom floor is the recording studio, and upstairs is where living happens. But well, that, that's awesome. Are you single, or do you have a family in that house? Too? Um, I've got a girlfriend in Chicago, so this is this is like the bachelor pad. Awesome. <laughs> What'd you say, Mike? I'm sorry. Chicago is the optimal word there, Ken. <laughs> And they're by himself up, up to no good. <laughs> well, you just look at the background. You can see like, hmm, yeah, I, my wife wouldn't I let that happen for too long. That I don't get buzzed on. There you go. Well, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. We get to talk to some really, really interesting gamut of people that are all trying to do the same thing, but they've made a decision on how they want to do it. And it's like, man, what Ken's doing is like, we could, no one can tell you no to that. You know, some people might say, no, you're not going to get to mix the next Adele record, but they can't say no. Like, go do your own thing, build your own business, build your own reality and then take it as far as you want to. And I was blown away with just the sound and the look. Very cool. You sort of have these videos. We're going to look at one, uh, but you have these videos where you just set up and you rock. And then it's like I asked Ken before the program, like, oh, yeah, you record that vocal afterwards, right? Because you're there in this room crammed into what looks like a living room, right? And they're just rocking at 11. And then this vocal comes in and it's like, there's no way that vocal was done live. And what did you tell me? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's live and it was a real accident because, I mean, it isn't easy with the... There's a, there's a few actual things. One is I am completely not really technically oriented as far as, you know, knowing things by the textbook so it, it's really something that we do by feeling and yes the drummer is four feet behind Evan when he's singing and I got this um SM7 USB podcasting mic at the beginning of the pandemic when I was doing um an orange live thing on Instagram every week and it turns out that when he stands in front of it and sings it pretty much blocks off everything because it's so directional and it's a little bit dull. So I have to add some highs to it. And the combination of that and our drummer uses a media symbols. And again, I don't know how they're hand hammered symbols, but they, they emit a frequency where somehow they don't get in the way of guitars and voice. It's really strange how that happens with the symbol. So he could be bashing on a symbol and you get that really nice thing of a symbol happening. It's a little aggressive, but it doesn't get in the way. So there's a way to make the vocal sit. And if you listen really closely, I mean, whatever slap I put on the vocal, it goes on the band a little bit from what bleeds and it gives it that seven. It's just an, it's yeah. all accidents that like, worked out like really ACDC. Well. We had um, Tony Platt on and he was saying like, Oh yeah, we have a bunch of room mics up and all the bass and guitars were bleeding out of their little ISO booths. So they're in the room and, there's something that if you put your room mics, if you put your vocal mic where a good room mic would be, yeah, then it's like, okay, I'm this this could actually work. Yep. And it's kind of that place where I mean where he's singing, that's about where you would angle like a nice tube mic down at the kick drum a little bit or in the center of the kit from there. So I mean, I really don't know how it happens and mixing it is really like putting a puzzle together because, you know, I want a little of this, but I've got this stuck there too. So it's, it's really, I, I think while I'm not a technician, that's the part about music that's really interests me since I was like four years old is the balance of sound. And I'm fascinated by using mono to create 
something that feels like it's stereo, but the drums are mono right up the center. The two guitars are hard left and right. And because there's just movement in the room, it kind of fills in some of the stuff. Yeah. I'm not really using effects because I, I, we print all the guitars, we print all the basses like it's a gig. So all that's left is like, how can I put a little plate on the vocal without screwing up the drums and, yeah. and get a little slap so it moves? And that's, the rest is just you know, kind of balancing. And it's, you take away all the excuses people have, right? It's like, oh, I got to record my bass separate then we're going to do a track of guitars and then we're going to do some keyboards and we're going to do the vocal and the drums. And we're going to mic every single drum and we're going to pan them all. Over. Like you take the excuse away because it's like, you're just figuring it out. And smart people at the end of the day, smart people can figure stuff out just by like you saying, Oh, the mic was darker. So when I add the little bit of EQ to it, it actually, it's a step beyond where you're at, but it shows that you just through deduction, you can end up getting to a place where it's like, wow, this is where yeah. we're at here. Most people would freak out. If they had to record yeah. a vocal in with the drums. The great thing with, with my art and life is I'm not that person. Like if you look at the studio, it's like there's shit laying around. It's like, I don't do a clean until I'm done with a project. Like it kind of grows while the project's yeah. happening. And then it's like, okay, I'm done. I got to start fresh again. And it kind of works. But, and yeah, with, with the figuring it out part, um, I mean, there are compromises to make, you know, to get the vocal just a little bit brighter so it cuts and sits on top. I always think, I mean, that the cymbals are just like, eh, it's just a little harsh. But it also, when you put it all together, it's the band has toured for over 850 shows over the eight years that I've been in the band. And um, I think that's what you're getting. It's yeah. it's. Great point. And, and that's what that's what allows us to have the studio like that is because it captures what we really are. And I think that's the goal. Like if I'm working with a pop singer in London in a nice studio and I want to get a good acoustic and vocal and we have the luxury to be in a good room, then that's what happens at that moment. But I think with our band, we've the last record that we did, we did the two inch at a nice studio and there's just something about sitting in a place where you work every day that lets shit flow. And it mm -hmm. feels like, you know, we're able to capture, we had the luxury during pandemic, you know, we get together three times a week and we play and when it's good, we keep it. And they're, they're live. I mean, okay. A couple of the songs, there's definitely no overdubs, but there were a couple songs where it's like, the ending was so good from this one that we just clipped it on to another version and we don't use the click track. So it's really got the breath of what it feels. I mean, I wouldn't want to be in Music. a band without that. I, I was writing songs and producing pretty much straight out of, you know, college and high school time. And this is the first time I've got to do it like this and be in the band and, and just be natural. Mm -hmm. And man, it's, it's like, why didn't I do that 20 years ago? Well, Mike, Mike always talks about the old Led Zeppelin records and the back whenever they weren't using clicks. And there's while everybody admits that they love that some for some reason, we've been programmed to say this is how you make records. And you find that whenever you make them out of necessity, where it's like, well, we have to put the vocalist in front of the drummer because that's the setup today. And that's what the roles are. Then you like all the compromises you make and then you pull the faders up. And every time I pull the faders up in those instances, I'm always like, huh, that's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And in fact, it's got something to it that the clean vocal in the ISO booth doesn't have. Yeah, it, it really does. And I think that a singer, when they're playing guitar and singing, is going to be different than when they yeah. put their guitar down yeah. and they sing it without a guitar. So I, I just think it's so fun to try it this way. And I mean, it, it is always different. And click tracks are, you know, I, I just finished an EP with a really good artist in London um, that we actually started in Nashville like a year and a half ago. And she's got a beautiful voice and, and she plays guitar. And we started with vocal and guitar live, but on most of the tracks, there was some kind of a beatbox loop or somebody was going like this with their hands. There, there was time 
that made it easy for me to add on and edit later. And yeah. it still feels live because for me personally, I just like that feeling when things are almost not right. There's something I've always liked it since I was a little kid, changing channels on the radio, driving yeah. my parents crazy in the car. There was, there's just, it's called magic. Yeah. And, and I've right? always, and I mean, I've also, you know, I, I used to think I was really snobby, but there is something when something happens in that room and it has nothing to do with music, but it comes into the music. And I kind of live for that. That really is, it's, it's been, when I think back since I started music playing guitar, when I was like 12, I, I liked that stuff. Like mm -hmm. I noticed things in Pink Floyd records where it's like, God, that's, or Jimmy Page, you know, it's like he was always going for something and sometimes he didn't make it, but I felt like he did make it because he went for it. Yeah. And they all left that stuff on records in the seventies, which was so cool. You know, when you listen, to, I spent years listening to Beatles records, like only the left side for a day and then only the right side <laughs> because there's so much stuff hidden in them. Yeah. And yeah. it's so, it's just fascinating. Let's show them what we're talking about here. I'm going to share my <laughs> screen here. So this is part of your living room sessions. Right. Um, is, and, yeah. And it says it's recorded two eight twenty one. So a recent thing. What's the name of the song we're going to watch? This is called No Control. Awesome. We'll watch and we'll stop along the way. And if, cool. if there's a reason to. Yep. We got to talk a little about this. All right. So as I'm looking around this frame here, <laughs> you can see we've got uh, we've got an, an 810 SVT on the left. Yeah. It looks like a Fender tweed over it, by the SVT. And that's it looks... a PV Classic 50. OK. Right. And yeah, that's it's really what's really cool is that Evan has always played PV amps and I've played orange and there's something about when the two guitars blend that only works with this combination that really feels like it's glue. So we've just kept the same thing for, we've tried stuff and it never sounds the same. So we're just sticking with what works. And you've got what I'm assuming there's a gobo between that tweed and the drum kit. Yes, there and is another gobo. And then you've got an orange amp over there. That's your amp. Yes. Right. Okay. And one vocal mic. I don't see any other vocal mics. Right. Always one uh, vocal. Drum kit has uh, tom mics. Uh, yes. It's, it's, it seems like it's all mic'd up. There's and a 441 on the low tom. There, there's some AG clip on, on the rack tom. And then kick drum is the new version of the um, D12. 
the, right. the powered version, I think it is. And Any, anything on the hat? You can't yeah, remember. I don't really use it. There's a um, a new 451, a, new, a newer version on the hat. And then overhead, I'm using a Horsch, which is a German tube U47 microphone. It's, it's really good. I got that when I lived in Germany. And um, then I'm using a, I think it's an AT1040 or something like that, Audio Technica. And that's just to pick up that side of the kit. But I got them so they're in phase and they're in mono. And, um, you know, obviously that's a wild thing to not have matched mics on your overhead. <laughs> it's all that was there when we started. And it just, right. Necessity yeah. of invention, right? <laughs> it, but, you know, and what's this vocal mic we're looking at here? So um, that is, uh, God, I don't even know what that is. I think it's a... Um, Looks just like a handheld. Yeah, let me, I can tell you one thing. Uh, okay. I'm going to go with Audix. Audix, yeah. I mean, it kind of looks like the Neumann, oh, but not. God, there's no writing on it. It's um, oh Jesus, it's a it's a big brand. I'm so bad with that stuff. But but just a, a regular dynamic. It's a pre- yeah. Microphone. We we have actually switched over. Um, I don't know if you can can see it, but this is what we use now. We've we've switched over. Um, to my podcast microphone. Oh yeah, that SM7 USB. It's mic. like a S. Yeah, and there's something. It's really strange. I mean, I I really only got this because I was doing a lot of things talking on the internet, and I just felt like I had no control about what I was doing. Right. And the other day, I even was doing a quick um write, and I needed an acoustic guitar, and I just this was sitting here, and I used it. And it sounded really, really good on a, I got an old um, hummingbird from the 60s. And it was like, man, this is a really good mic. And then we started trying it with vocals and it just seems to have the right frequencies for, I mean, you know, it's not an expensive mic, but it gets the job done. Right. I'm going to go back to this um, image here. And, And for those of you just listening to the podcast, these guys are all in one room and this room looks like it's maybe 12 foot wide by 14 it's a, it's a small yeah. like, craftsman kind of house and they're all just rocking in this space and you could tell it's not like this thing where the level's incredibly low you guys probably have the level in that room where you want it right it's it's gig volume pretty much gig volume yeah. and what's on your guitars uh microphone wise and bass? um i'm using sennheiser 906s on both guitars okay and is that a dynamic mic um it's god is it the 609, right? Oh, yes. Maybe 609. It's, yeah, sorry. That's, which is like see, the new version of the 409, which that sort of square looking awesome mic for guitars. Right. It's the same thing that we use live. And if it's like the 409, it's a dynamic mic, meaning it doesn't need phantom power. And is your bass right. a direct line or is there a mic on it? Um, no, it's all, all mic. The bass is going DI. Okay. So my question for you is when I'm listening to this and I'm hearing like, Okay, you're going from this section. It's sort of like um, Black Hole Sunny with the Cole Ebo thing you're doing. And then we get into that big rocking section where he does the four count on the hat and you guys are just at 11. Is that just a massive manic uh, Pro Tools fader switch where you're like, your mix is totally changing to accommodate? Or is that, are these mics pretty much set it no, and forget it? No, it's, I mean, it, it really... There, there, I'm doing fader moves, but there's nothing really rad going on. And from, from the clean part, the, see again, the the best thing about all of this is that we've been playing together for eight years now, and we're friends. And it's that thing where it's more than music. You know, we've experienced a lot together. We've been on the road, and there's just something about the way we've been doing it that works. So, I mean, there are we we did a cover of Ellen Rigby, and Luckily, there was a breakdown part where there weren't a lot of symbols. So I did have the luxury to do some weird vocal stuff and it didn't get crazy with. But in general, the rule is when I'm mixing for myself is like, you know, I raise the solos where they're up to somewhere where the le- they're up to the drum. So they really feel loud. But I'm using a, um, I'm using Gabriel Curry. He's a really good guitar builder in Detroit. He made me uh, a clean boost and it's just an 18 dB 
clean boost that's it's kind of along the lines of what Quan does mm -hmm. it's a little nastier but it, it works for my setup so i'm always hitting that for solos like i do live so, so the mixing is happening on the floor pretty much yeah right and like i kind of noticed like that intro where you're rocking out and when you go to the vocal let me go to it um and i mean i didn't even that's what's really funny is i just noticed that my battery was dead on the ebo and i still used it <laughs> So check this out. I'm going to try to get, okay, we're going to go to the intro here. My perception is that this microphone, the vocal mic is on. And when he walks up to it, it's not like you unmute it and start playing. Let's listen real quick. And you tell me if I'm right. Okay. right before you go to the before he goes to the vocal mic there Doxy, nothing, feelings I don't understand. now my perception would be like hey if i'm engineering this thing i'm gonna keep that vocal mic off until he starts rocking <laughs> right but I, that's not happening um no i okay i'm not 100 percent sure i think on this one because it's the other mic I was riding the vocal mic a little bit off, but it was too dramatic if I muted it. Right. So I didn't have that option with this podcasting miking when he sings, because it's less focused on, you know, what's around, I can mute it. And depending on the song, like what's really interesting is if it's a song with a big chorus, I can mute it in the like, in because our arrangements aren't always radio based. They're, they're, you know, they they do um, some interludes and some solos in the middle where you wouldn't necessarily have it on a radio song. And there I actually do mute the vocal mic sometimes. So when the chorus or the next part comes in, it adds the dynamics of what's going on in the room right with the vocal. And I mean, okay. obviously, it depends if there's a symbol right before the vocal comes in, it usually won't work. And I just right. I have to find my way around each song, how I'm going to approach it based on the arrangement, because there are some of those if factors about, you know, what, how the vocal and the room will react together. I wonder like if, when you say about you, when you went into that uh, 24, the two inch 24 track room and a big studio, I almost wonder, I, there's probably things at the end of the day, these recordings in this little room that are kind of unkept probably have something that those don't. Right. Oh, it's, it's okay. I mean, Night there's a, it's night and day the 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 emotion is so much more direct because there's nothing to hide like i yeah there it's i'm really really happy and i mean but i'm also not i've never been one of those guys that finds fault with things that are a little bit on the edge like i'm like you know mott lang makes great records and i know that yeah. he would probably toss and turn in his sleep for a year after listening to something like this because yeah it's like i'm not hearing the imperfections as much but when something doesn't feel right then i have that reaction yeah like and i can't explain it you know it's like this is the equivalent of that scene in uh, apollo 13 where they went into the engineers and they threw out a box full of like odd shaped things that were in the lab that weren't <laughs> in the they needed to like make a filter this is the equivalent of that because we've been trained like oh you got to have an SSL. You can have a two-inch tape machine. You got to have every plug-in manageable. You got to have barefoot monitors. You've got to, have, you know, these headphones, yeah. these microphones. And then at the end of the day, you've got a dude that shows up with like, oh, I'm going to use this U47 tube as one half of my overheads in this <laughs> Audio Technica over here, <laughs> right? And it's like I'm going to use this podcasting mic that has a USB out as my vocal mic. And it's the equivalent of like those guys getting the extra two volts they needed right to, to and get the i do think about record. that i it's, i mean i do think about how unorthodox it is it's not like i'm just going this is the best it's like i mean i i lived in london for 10 years and i had my room at livingston studios and we had a neve room and an ssl room and it was um you know it was it was that like i when i you know needed to do something and i had to went downstairs i i could go in the mic cabinet and you know bring up pairs of everything back to the 50s 
and have it. And yeah, that's cool. And I mean, obviously I can't afford that or I probably would put this situation in, I would mix the two a little bit more. But when I think back to the first studio I had when I grew up in Los Angeles and I had a, a little room in my um, flat there and it was, it's always been the same thing. It's like, I'm the guy that sat there with two Porta studios trying to make Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, it's like, I've always been fascinated with the vibration of what music does and how it goes together. And that's more important to me than how it gets there. Well, as long it, as I feel good, it's good. You know what you end up doing? You end up focusing on the music. Right. Not on SM69 stereo tube microphones placed at the perfect distance with perfectly silent room where the air conditioning comes on you don't hear it and then the lighting and then you know the console which mic pre are we going to use let's go over here and let's think about it. and are we going to two inch tape and you know are we going to do all this stuff almost we're in this age right now where everything is so perfect that it's just the homogenization of everything like this this feels fresh all over again right <laughs> when you hear it, it's just like these are dudes rocking in a room man and right. not even that they're not rocking in you know ocean way studios man this is like this is like rock and roll right here. It, it really translates i'd encourage you all to go to the hero jr youtube channel and we'll put it down in the links but watch some of these videos if you're only listening to the audio only portion of this podcast uh watch this stuff because it's like there's a visual aspect to it that's really organic to it but i believe it i remember I loved Rage Against the Machine and Andy Wallace. I'm pretty sure Andy Wallace mixed Killing in the Name up. Is yep. that okay? Right. And it was fantastic. It was awesome. But then Brendan O'Brien came out with Evil Empire. And the stories, uh, I don't know about the truth of them, but the stories I heard was a lot of that was rehearsal room recordings, was handheld SM7s, dude standing there holding an SM7 in the room. Like I heard that was the vibe of those records. And when you listen to it, it comes across like this is a lo-fi, awesome. But there was something like prehistoric about it that fit that band's mission statement to a T. And when I heard it, it was like, this is what this should be. And that's why I was asking you about the two inch room. You know, it's yeah. like so many times I've gone into the perfect recording environment and ended up with somehow an imperfect outcome, even though all the numbers should add up on an Excel document. But when yeah. you listen, you're like, I listen and watch these videos and they're super interesting, super organic. I know that if I went to see that band, it would feel that way. And there's something that yeah. comes out of the speakers that's genuine. And it's the antithesis of everything all the things you could have, all the luxuries you could have, you're kind of just saying, I need to record like the, those old Beatles conversations. Of course, we're going to use a U47. It's all we have in the studio. What's your vocal yeah, mic? U47. Exactly. What's going on the drums? You know, it's like, it's like, what do we use? What mic pre? We use the mic pre that's in the console because it's before the tape machine. What do you mean? What mic pre? You know, it, <laughs> yeah, just, it lessens all the math and you end up sometimes with a, a thing that, you know, because of its flaws, it's great. And I, and I really do think that there's a certain situation. I mean, for us, I can only speak, you know, for myself, but I'm searching for an honesty with, with art, with music, with life, where they kind of blend together. And I think this is where it led to with the band. And I think there's, there's people that have their honest element that really shines through the way they do it. And, you know, they're like Mott Lang. It's like, how else are you going to record a Def Leppard record? That right. That's like... But that being said, Def Leppard, like Through the Night, that record... Right. That's, that's the a, beginning, right? Like when they were 17 years old? Yeah, and I don't... Did Mutt do that? No, Mike? he didn't, I don't think. Okay, so that record, it had a hit on it. But um, that record felt like a rock record. Yep. And, then, um, and then what was the record that they had that was right after that? That was like in the 4 and 4 era... Uh, Pyromania. Right. Pyromania Mutt came on. And that record was, it was still like, it was all hits and it was great. And it, but it felt cleaner. But oh, then yeah. They, whenever they got into hysteria and, and, um, uh, you know, when it got to be like, I almost felt like the band wasn't even, the band was reached for like you'd reach for a drum machine, you yeah. know? And, and for me, 
I, I appreciate that stuff. It feels like a baby face record to me, you know, but it's just so clean. It's almost like the band was removed from the band at that point. Yeah. In some aspects. That's my guilty, like, because I, you know, we all want what we don't have. And because I've got that really kind of organic, I don't care as long as it feels good attitude, which really does suit me. I do always wonder what it would be like to have those ears because there's, you know, even if it's not my thing and I don't really think it's rock, it's more pop. When you crank that loud on a radio, it's pretty impressive how that's made. And mm, I am yeah. fascinated by craftsmanship yeah. even if the emotion isn't always there sometimes i get it there's something about it loses its humanity though right and loses then there's people it. that have hit both of them like led zeppelin one and two i mean th those have the sonic shit and the emotion and the songs and the like to me records like that are still pretty raw they just like you said the beatles these are the mics we had and this is what we used i don't think they really fussed when they were doing that well, but that being said i read the um jeff emmerich book i don't remember the title and jeff uh retells a bunch of stories about how they were breaking the rules of abbey road you know that was back in the day when you'd see those pictures and the engineers would actually have white lab coats on <laughs> yeah so they look like pharmacists but like they would said like, hey, you have you use this to mic your drums and you put them this distance. And those guys were kind of like off the radar, breaking the rules of Abbey Road when they did yeah. those records. They did some incredible things. There's a story that I heard. I don't know if it's in that book, but they talked about putting a, a microphone into a, a prophylactic and dipping it down into <laughs> a mason jar. Right. And then they all sung around this mason jar and sang. And they didn't use it because it sounded like shit. But the fact that they tried it is like what we're talking about here. You know, it's yeah. like we have to recognize there are some rules. You got to find out what the rules are and then you know when you can break them. But it's all art. And the more you're focusing on the technology, when you talk about guys like Rick Rubin, Daniel Lanois, some of these producers that uh, Don was that are like connected to these records that are like overflowing with that stuff. These guys they don't want the session to stop creatively because of technology. You know, right. it's like when you spend too much time on a guitar song, next thing you know, the guitar performance is, is suffering because of it. So, you know, I think that what I really love about what you're doing is that anybody can do it. Yeah. It's a hundred percent on them. The art that you build is your, your perception of the pieces laid in front of you and you do it however you have to. A USB mic is, that's so weird. If you were to tell somebody I'm using a USB I, mic. I thought it was weird. Pro I, I found it. I thought it was weird too. I, I, a lot of the stuff is accidents and, and necessity, I mean, necessity. Yeah. Necessity right? and, and budget restrictions. Like, I mean, I've been, for example, I've been an NS 10 guy forever just because I think that if you can find a way to make it work on those, it's going to translate pretty well with rock music. I mean, pop music and, and hip hop, it's a whole different game, but what what's really been great for me this year is I met the guys at Cali Audio. Do you know those speakers? Mm -mm. They're a they're a lower priced. Um, they're under a thousand dollars a pair. They're called IN eights, and they're three way. And what's re and the mid range is mounted on the woofer. I hope I get this right. So time aligned like a tenor. Yeah, it's speaker. like it's that's exactly what I told. Um, that's exactly what I told Nate. I said, it reminds me of a mini version of those old URI monitors that you used to find in studios. Yeah. And these monitors are actually, I've, you know, they're, they're for sure the only real expensive ones that I've had at home that I used a lot were the M ones by Din Audio. And I think that these speakers, like if you're starting out or you don't have a big budget, but you've got the vision to do something at home or in a smaller studio, these are such a great speaker to have because at low to mid volume in a room, the, I, the rooms aren't treated except for some things hanging to break up any standing waves that might be around. It's not, there's no design here. These speakers are pretty accurate. I didn't even use my NS10s for the last year, which for me, that's a huge what thing. What size is the woofer? Are they eights? It's, oh, yeah, they're eights, I and yeah. eights. And yeah. they are, you know, they're, and they've already, 
from what I've heard, done a new pair that's a little less noisy. I mean, I, the noise doesn't bother me. I hear a tiny bit of noise, but again, and they have an band, amplifier inside of them. Yeah, and between those, and then I I check everything on these clips reference headphones. Yeah. Those are the other, th- and and then the the main other thing that's re- I've got like a little a really bad iPod dock. And then I use this as my mono reference, yeah. which is a $79 speaker, which right. is, it's heavy. It doesn't color anything. And at low volume, again, it's like I can check to make sure that my left and right, because I'm doing so much stuff in mono that I do like to check and just yeah, make yeah, sure. That, that brings me back. When you, you said your drum kit's mono. So the, in these recordings we watch, you take all those mics and you pan the mono. Yeah, they're straight up center, everything. So your left and right overheads, are sh- everything's dead center. Yes, and that took a little second to get it so it wasn't wishing around because of the room, but right. not too long. I mean, I'm really, like, I'm not technical. And it's for me, it's all about what feels good for, for me, and it doesn't always jive with other people. But I, I love working with the people that just want to, experiment and be natural and i mean daniel lenoir is really he's one of my favorite i've always loved him and it's just the way he just takes a journey through sound until it suits him it's it's so cool and like you said the beatles yeah they they were not inventing anything else except how to use the old stuff they use for radio shows on loud music i've got um have you ever listened to those sergeant pepper where they've put it on pro tools, like they've done some transfers. Yeah. I think I may have a couple of those down at the barn. Like you can, you can hear them laughing on the vocal tracks. You could hear the orchestra leader counting out bars when everything's going crazy. Like there is so much stuff. hidden. They left that in a day of the life. That section section with a chromatic section. That guy counting was actually counting people back in and they couldn't get rid of it because it was bleeding on something. So they just put tape delay on it. It's awesome. (laughs) They just turned it up. They kept adding. Yeah. They kept regenerating the tape delay. So when it got to the end, it was like, it was, it's awesome. Right. It's like, let's take our insecurities. Let's take our failures and turn them up louder. So they become a thing. Yeah. Right. It's like the ultimate, like, how do we get, you know, the Apollo 13 situation. It's like, how do we turn this into an asset rather than, you know, something that we're, that we're trying to hide. Um, I wanted to bring up something. Um, So when you pan all these things, mono, right. This is a little, this little lesson. I don't know what you're, how hip you are to this. So when you deal with phase, and this is one of those topics that whenever you talk about it, everybody is putting it into uh, online forums, but very few people really have a comprehension of phase. Uh, there's two types of phase you deal with. One's called absolute phase. One's called relative phase. Absolute phase is, in essence, if your speakers were wired out of phase. So whenever the woofer is supposed to do this, it's doing, one of them would be doing this, right? right. You hear that right away. It sounds like you're in a fish tank. Your brain, go, you start to get nauseous. It's weird right? The 180 yeah. degrees, that's 180 degrees out of phase, absolute phase. This also happens when you have a microphone cable. If you have a hundred microphone cables, some of them are going to be twisted. And all of a sudden you'd be like, wait a minute, if it's on the same thing, you'd be like, that's 180 degrees out of phase. Very noticeable. When you have a drum kit, like what you have, it's all relative phase. So it's phase relative to one another. So it's 12 degrees out of phase, 40 degrees out of phase. And depending on what you're referencing, if you're referencing your kick drum, every one of those drums will be a different percentage of out of phase with that drum, right? Right. But what we love about drum kits is that phase. It will give it this if you do it right. And you're like a guy, like a super engineer, you know, you mic up a drum kit, you can create an illusion of space. If you went onto your timeline and lined all the phase of those things up perfectly so that when the snare, let's say you're going to say the snare is what I care about. Every time that snare hits, I'm going to go into the tom and I'm going to make the snare drum in that tom line up perfectly in phase. If you do that, your mix of your drums will go from this worldwide to this, which is like, I hate it, right? Yeah. So relative phase is a good thing if you know how to do it, you don't violate some rules. What you're doing within relative phase, when you put everything in mono, your phase is perfect, regardless of every little bit of relative phase that's out of phase. Right. So if your toms are messing with your snare drum a little, your overheads messing with your kick drum a little bit, all of that goes away. Your phase is 
absolutely perfect because when you sum it to mono, the relative phase will act as an EQ. So whatever the net result is, is perfectly in phase. If you take all those mics and right. pan them left and right, now you've introduced all of this again, which is like, oh, I've got phase issues. But your end result, when you put your drums totally in mono, it's as powerful. If you get those mics placed in the right position, they'll be as powerful as a mono microphone that was one of these epic, let's say like Led Zeppelin drum sounds, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Where there's minimal phase, maybe three mics. So what people don't understand is once you put something on, if you have two mics on a guitar and you pan them directly on top of one another, it might affect the EQ if there's some phase shift there. Right. But the net result on phase in your mix is zero. It's 100% yeah. in phase. If you had a phase meter, it would go all the way to the plus. Yeah. So you're doing a really interesting thing, which is another thing that Tony Platt talked about with Back in Black when we interviewed him, was that he would try to keep the drums mostly mono drums and bass and vocals, but he was a big fan of panning the other stuff and keeping it, you know, and letting the room then give you an overall situation. I think what's maybe really cool about your mixes, especially on my little iPhone and through my iMac speaker is that the phase, it feels like a rock band, like those yeah, drums. It's, it, uh, it, and really, I mean, I understand all of those things, but it's, it's really, it's not an accident, but that was the goal one by necessity it's like it wouldn't work in stereo really in that room to get the power and i've just always been a fan of that like we're always trying to get our sound to be as simple as possible like this is what we're working with and so when you're in a room that small you really don't notice a stereo field when everybody's playing and the way we create our depth is just because we're a two guitar band. I just hard pan guitars left and right. And it does fill in some weird, like between the vocal bleed and a little, like my side of the baffle is so clean. I could actually replace guitars. I would never do that, but I could. It's a clean, it's, there's no bleed. And Evan's side, because he's got an open back cabinet, he's getting drums through his guitar a little bit it's not enough to make a difference but when you add all those little things together it right. creates a weird field and then when and i do you know i use compression and i do different kinds of compression like over the drum bus and then after i get the guitars the way i want it i also do a bus with the guitars mm -hmm. where they each hit each other so it, it kind of makes it groove a little bit more so there's like small little things i do and every time i do a little thing it's doing something to the accident that's happening. So right. there's just shit going on and I well, couldn't analyze how it. Hard do, how hard do you hit your vocal with compression um, on average? Oh, it's, I'd say between three and five okay. dB. It's, I can't do too much because the mic's not good enough to really be able to expand. Like I have to find a sweet spot that doesn't pick up the cymbals enough right. and that gets the vocal. So I, I can get the vocal out in front a little. Um, I'm using a really good plugin. It's kind of new. It, I, I subscribe to a few things and it's the um, plugin Alliance subscription. They've got a really cool little API, both versions of the seventies API stuff. And mm -hmm. that compressor seems to work pretty good on vocals. Yeah, because it 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 likes to suck the vocal in, but it doesn't screw with the cymbals. And the other thing is, um, Stephen Slate's got some good stuff. Especially, he's got that one vocal. It just brings up the high end over the top of everything, and you could kind of control it by balancing out the the pass filter and the amount of the effect. And that oh, kind of grabs. Some, I've just tried a lot of things to get the vocal where you could hear the vocal clearly, but it didn't do too much to the cymbals. All out of necessity. All right. out of like, hey, All how do I, I got a flat tire, I'm on the side of the road, how do I exactly. jack the car up and get it changed? And, and we're that band, so it works. And I'm that yeah. guy, and we're all, like, it's re we're not trying to be anything except it, the method fits who we are. It's not going to work so on a baby amazing. face record. Yeah. What, <laughs> no. what about your, our, our new segment? What's on your two bus? Is there what's on your two bus for these recordings? Um, Master Fader. Yep. Yeah, so I start out 
I, I mix everything without, a, without anything. I start, like, I would say I do, we're pretty much balanced. So I push faders up. I get the vocal in a relative place. My, my whole thing is I like the vocal to be a little bit above the snare drum, but I don't want to lose the drums because I've got the vocal too loud. I'm always trying to find that energy. But then I'll use, um, on most of these, I used the Steven Slate for the, um, the channel, like through the Neve setting. And I added a tiny bit of low end, like around 100, and then a little bit on top. And then I ran that into, uh, it's like the, um, I think it's something that Chris Lord Algae worked on with them. It's a, it's called the red compressor. It's supposed to be a yeah. model of his. Focus I just right read three. It would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I use, I don't know, I hit it kind of soft, like one and a half DB, not, not too hard. And then I put it into a tape, a little bit of tape. Like, a, you know, a simula the Steven Slate tape machine. I mean, because I'm not so anal about everything, I like what it does. It just glues everything together. And I, you know, I don't have a patch bay or anything. So that's not this studio. So I can't use tape. And sometimes I'll use cassette if I'm really desperate to get something to warm up. I'll fly it on a cassette and back, but not with this. And then, um, and then I, that's it. And so, and then, I'm really lucky to have a cool guy that I've worked with for more than 10 years. His name is um, Ed and he is um, a mastering engineer in London and he has worked with me. Yeah. For 10 years. And he just, he gets it when, when we work together, it's like his first master, the, mas the first master I always get back is him trying to make it into the best and biggest radio thing it could be, which he's great at it. And I always, we, it's been the same way for 10 years. He sends me something and it's always, what did you put on the vocal? It sounds like you've got something coursing, making it wider. What did you do here? And it's like, we take that off and we find a happy medium. And the next one is always, he, he knows how I want it to sound. And so it's a really good combination. I don't do a whole lot on the master bus because I know that, he knows the couple tweaks that'll make what I do just a little bit more um, even and transferable when you go across all medium, but it keeps the vibe of what we did. Like it's pretty close because usually I master for other people. And so I give him a master that I like, and I just say, give it that extra 10% that I just don't have. Cause he's got hardware and yeah. you know, are you limited and, anything when it, before it goes to him? Pardon? limiting anything before it goes to ed or are you taking the limiter off oh i mean i use i i treat it the same way as if i was in a big studio like if i was working in an ssl room i'd probably hit the ssl a little bit because i just like that sound i i like it when it it's i think that whatever i do in the master bus it kind of glues together the but we're not talk, we're talking gotten. about like a brick wall limiter like one of oh, those no, I don't, get it to zero I, I don't ever use, even, even when I'm mastering, that's my least favorite sound. Right. I, yeah, right. I, I, don't, it's, I, I like dynamics and I don't care that we're not louder than everybody else. Like there's some, some artists I really like, I, I love Metallica, but there's a couple records of theirs that are so loud. I can't even listen to it because it's almost like something's distorting in it. It's yeah. just really loud. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm trying, I, I like, what hitting a compressor does to a band, especially in a situation like this where it probably needs a little extra glue around the edges. It really does help, but I'm not I'm not a big fan of whacking the shit out of something because it makes it smaller and it might sound great on a phone, but when you listen on speakers or headphones, it's just uncomfortable. The vibration's weird when you just smack things for the it. smack's sake. So uh, where can people find you? Where's so, some good links? The the best links, um, if you go to our website, www.herojuniormusic.com, that kind of feeds out anywhere you need to be, especially the live stuff. And then, um, yeah, there's 
I've I've really done a lot of stuff, but I'm I'm really a kind of in the moment person. So, I mean, I started out working with Giorgio Moroder in that group when I was 18 years old, and that's a whole other thing than where I got to now. And this is where I'm happy. But there is the other thing that I um I'm really happy with is this record that I started actually in Paula's living room with my friend Alexia from London. And that's out now. She her name's Alexia Challen. And that's a completely other side of the kind of work I do. She's a singer-songwriter, and it's kind of hand, it's also handmade, very handmade. But we started that in another living room with two mics. And then that was something I sent around to friends and we kind of different people, we put some strings on it. And but it was also pretty much everyone else's living room. Yeah. Living just, room I don't know, something about people working at home in their environment. Yeah. We all feel good about it. And I think we're not the only ones that, you know, it's like a, doing stuff that way. It's a great point. If you, as soon as you get that red light fever from being in a room that looks too like where you're focused on the clock, it changes the way you do things. Yeah, it does. So, uh, you know, we just talked to Andrew Sheps and, and he said something about working with Rick Rubin, which I think pertains very much to today's episode, which is you're not done with it until it's great. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter. Yeah. Forget SSL, forget Neve, forget <laughs> API, forget microphones. It's not done it's, until it's great. And if you can do that on an iPhone, you can find a way to record it with just iPhone yeah. microphones. If that's the case, I don't care. People don't care what comes out. All that matters is what comes out of the speakers. I think that you're really good testament to that. I think it's really a valuable lesson for us as we search for gear and search for like answers. The answers is really the music finding yes. a way to just put whatever, what are you recording with today? Well, if it's the pickup and your guitar facing something, if that's all you have, that's what you'll yep. do. Yeah. You find a way to embrace what's unique about it. And that's what you've done with these videos. Very cool stuff. Hero Thanks junior. So much. Yeah. Really fun. Really Ken really Rose. So thank you everyone. Uh, all the links down in the description. We appreciate you hanging with us and uh, we'll let you get back to rocking out. That's the room behind you. If you're watching the YouTube video, that room behind you is where you shoot. Yep. Yep. So that's cool to see it just back there. Like as another addendum to this room, it's just looks like a little, <laughs> looks like a dining room. And everybody's responsible for noticing if their mics moved. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Amazing. yeah i've done that dude i was playing a gig once and i was so angry at the sound guy it was a trio gig and i was playing banjo on this gig and doing three-part harmony with the people you know we were playing this like real intimate thing and i was fuming because the sound guy would always like leave and go smoke out in the alley and i'm like the whole gig i was saying <laughs> i am going to get off stage i'm gonna go right to that sound guy and i'm gonna let him have it so the last <laughs> song is done I reached down to unplug my banjo and I realized that I had forgotten to plug it in <laughs> at the beginning of the gig. I was so like, it, awesome. was, it was one of those moments where like I had all this angst and I had nowhere to dump it. But uh, yeah, everybody's responsible for the microphone. That's a good, that's a good motto. Live and it, you by. know, they, they move. I mean, I know in the middle of recordings, you, I, I, I'll hit the mic, I'll hit the overhead mic. And yeah. it's again, if you don't fall down dancing, it's good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us and letting us see a sliver of your life. Everything you're doing is you're created in these walls that we're seeing here on microphones yep. that you grabbed and multi-purposed or doesn't even, you know, not even matching. This is like guerrilla warfare. And if you're coming out with a really great piece of art, so it's Thanks cool so to see how you do it. That's right it on. for this week's this week, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's from the West Barn. And also remember, we're so late in this podcast, probably no one will get to this exact exact moment. But we've got a widget on our website if you want to go on to fromthewestbarn.com and leave us a message. We'd love to get your voicemail. Any questions you have, comments, anything. We'll air them on the on the podcast and answer them and or uh, just if they're interesting, we'll play them. So we'd love to hear from you. That's it. Signing off this, this week from the West Barn. It's Joe West, Mike Shimshack, and Ken Rose. Be well.